what is the purpose of putting all this together? Where am I going to go with this curiosity? You can be endlessly curious, and we can spend hours on the computer, but in the end, I have to have an aim for that as well. So that's why, even though it's a muscle, how am I going to apply those muscles? Welcome to the Curious Advantage podcast, an exploration of the idea of curiosity and its increasing importance for thriving in the digital age from the authors of The Curious Advantage. Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Curious Advantage podcast. This series is about how individuals and organizations use the power of curiosity to drive success in their lives and businesses, especially in the context of our new digital reality. It brings to life the latest understanding from neuroscience, anthropology, history, business, art, and behaviorism about curiosity and makes these useful for everyone. My name is Garrick Jones. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, The Curious Advantage. And today I'm filling in for my co-authors, Paul Ashcroft and Simon Brown. And we're delighted to be joined by Michael Spencer. Hi, Michael. Hi, Garrick. Very nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. You're welcome. Michael is Managing Director of Sound Strategies, which he's going to tell us all about. But he's also a great violinist and academic, not only in the UK, but also in Japan, which is one of the things I really want to talk with him about, because we're interested in context and how you enter situations which are completely different from what we're used to. We talk about that in the book a lot. Welcome again, Michael. I'm absolutely delighted you're able to join us today. It's always interesting to have these conversations, isn't it? We live quite closely to each other, but actually it's really strange to be sort of connecting up screen to screen, as it were. Well, what, some of the greatest conversations I've had at dinner parties have been when you were around, I have to say. So hopefully we can um, bring some of those topics to bear today. Well, thank you so much. You always throw very good dinner parties and very interesting guests, and they're most stimulating. So I come away with a lot whenever I've been to one of them. Now, you have an impressive journey from being a full-time performer, a violinist with the London Symphony Orchestra, but you've also become the head of education at the Royal Opera House, and from there you're working and teaching in Japan. Not only that, I happen to know <laughs> that you also have played fairly regularly with the Empress of Japan. How did you come to this incredible journey? Yes, that is quite an accolade. Actually, I also have the reputation of being one of the few foreigners to ask Her Imperial Highness to stand up and to take part in a workshop, actually, which she did with great gusto. Uh, so oh. she, she's really wonderful, and she, she became a, a wonderful friend. So, yes, I did go to the palace. Uh, she's a very good pianist, and I took uh, friends up there, and we played chamber music together on a number of occasions. But, yes, it has been a, a very interesting journey. When I look back on it, when I reflect on it, it does seem strange how uh, I've managed to move from these different environments. And, and I think the common thing about it all was that the violin was my passport. And when I first mm. was given a violin, when I was 11 years old, so I was a late starter. And actually, for the first few years, I played folk music and country and western. You were a fiddler. I was a fiddler, very much so. And I didn't really start taking the violin seriously as a, a possible career prospect until I was about 19. And I'd gone to university and I was at, uh, it was an unusual course to take because most people go to conservatoires, but I went to university and it was Surrey University that I went to and it had just set up as a, a technological university. And mm. they had a course there in uh, sound engineering, and they needed some people to record. So they had this very tiny music department amongst all these uh, microbiologists and engineers. And so I mixed a lot with them during my uh, academic years, as it were. When I left there, and I suddenly realized I, I, if I was going to make the violin my living, I needed mm. to be a whole lot better. And I was lucky to meet with a teacher who was, it was uh, Ailey Goran, who was the leader of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, but also the leader of the Allegri Quartet. And as he mm. said mm, to me when I first met me, he said, yes, I like challenges. He said, but there's a lot of work. And in effect, he said, well, you can come to me, but we're going to work for a year and I will need you to practice every day for that year for nine hours. And at the end of that period, you will have a, a toolkit and then you can go away and learn to play the violin. You'll get a job of some sort. And then from that moment on, you use that toolkit to learn how to play the violin. How much time did you say that he, he was giving you for this to teach you the basics? 
Well, he was. I, I had two years with Amy because when I was at university, I started going to him. But after university, mm. I wanted to study with him, and it was very difficult to get to him. He was giving up time at the Guildhall. Uh, he was he was going to leave there, but he took mm. me on as a kind of a special favour, which was incredibly decent of him. And he was the most amazing man. But he did say, right. Don't go into Guildhall. You only come to my home. I will give you regular lessons, but you must practice nine hours every day. Nine hours a day. I can imagine you doing it because I know that you learned and taught yourself not only Japanese, but kanji, which is the writing system or one of the three writing systems in Japan. And you systematically did that. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think that if you want to really understand Japan, you've got to learn to read the script. Mm. It tells you a huge amount about the country and about the culture because there are these ideograms and they're so subtle in the way they're formed and the different meanings they have. There are many homonyms in Japanese and the way you distinguish one word from another is really from the kanji. So when friends write to me and they write in hiragana, which is one of the other scripts, mm. I don't find it particularly helpful. I want to see the kanji. So that hiragana and katakana have 50 characters in each, but kanji is 3,000 plus. How did you teach yourself all this? As an adult, I don't really want to go to these books which are really designed for children. And they all are, all those, those learning books, you know, it starts. Bear in mind that in Japan, the children really take some, uh, the students to, to, to learn about 17 or 18 before they have really a good working knowledge of, their, of how to write their language. Mm. So whereas in this country... In England, we'll have children reading Shakespeare or Dickens by the 12, 13, you know, something like that. The students in Japan can't really read their classics until the 17, 18, 19, amazing. because they don't have sufficient kanji. So I decided that actually I need that as an adult. I knew stuff. I knew how to learn other things. I needed to find a way to actually learn kanji, which was not using these books. And I did a bit of research, and I came up with something called the Major System, hmm. which was a medieval method of remembering numbers. Now, each kanji also has a number. And so what I started to do was to use a major system, which is a, a matter of applying letters to numbers to make stories to remember that number. And then I remembered the kanji from that. So you made a, quite a complex story for each kanji. But somehow it stuck in the mind. It was incredible. Each kanji kind of has a story to it, but this method put another layer on, which was really interesting. Yeah, where did you find the major system, medieval system for learning? Searched on the internet. <laughs> memory systems, because I mean, there are lots of learning systems out there, you know, the memory palaces sure. and all those sorts of things you can develop. But I, I thought, no, I, ne I need to find a way that, that is going to help me remember that is tried and tested and quite simple. And it, so I just applied this major system to it. The extraordinary thing was not only did I start to remember kanji, but I remembered the numbers. Mm. So people who give me a number, and I could tell them what the kanji was. Fascinating. It was quite bizarre. Until I found that actually I was remembering the numbers better than the kanji. So I kind of put that to one side and thought, right, I'm just going to stay with the kanji now. But looking at the kanji, it tells you such a lot about the language mm. and the culture. What's your favourite kanji? I'm not sure, actually. I couldn't answer that. But I like the surprises you get with kanji. So there's a word uh, called honne, and the two characters, one, the first one means truth, and the second one means sound. And honne is, is an interesting expression in Japanese culture because it means somebody's telling you what their true feelings are. Wow. So you have these two sets, honne and tatemai. Tatemai is what you want to show to the world, as it were. Honne is the deeper feelings, and you don't often get that in Japanese culture. But it's that nice idea of those two kanji about true sound. So I quite like that, that other combination. Now, we're going to talk in a moment about what you're really known for, these incredible events, incredibly creative experiences with deep learning that teaches people astonishing stuff in groups. But you've done that in Japan. And I just want to, how did you get from the Royal Opera House to Japan? And then how did you not only prepare yourself, but also... How did you enter this culture? How did you start to read and understand sufficiently to the point where you were able to work within that context? Well, my, my first contact with Japan was as a player when I was with the LSO. And I remember being on the flight out there and saying to one of my colleagues in the orchestra, I said, I know nothing at all about Japan. You've been there before. What can you tell me? She said, right, these are chopsticks. You hold them this way. You eat this with this, that with that. This is a tube map. 
now you're on your own. <laughs> and that was it. And I remember to this day walking out from the hotel very jet lagged. We got there in the evening and looking around. And at that time, this is talking over about 30 years ago now, none of the street signs had any Roman script, any Romaji there. So it was all Japanese and thinking, this is incredible. I don't understand anything. <laughs> this is really exciting. And then I went to the concierge and said, okay, tomorrow I want to go and we had a day off. I'd like to go somewhere. He said, well, where do you want to go? I said, Nara, which is about sort of 400, 450 kilometers away. And he said, okay. So he gave me a sheet of paper and I, it, the sheet of paper said, walk out of the door, walk 10 meters, turn left, go down the steps, at the bottom of the steps, turn right. And I followed this piece of paper. And about four hours later, I was in Nara. Amazing. And I was looking at the temple there. And then when I wanted to come back, I just inverted the paper. I followed the instructions all the way back. I thought, this is an incredible place. I just fell in love with it immediately. My quartet went there quite a lot. We did a lot of performances with my quartet. Then what happened was that. In, when I was in the orchestra, about sort of halfway through my 14-year period with them, I thought, you know, I need to move from this. I don't think that I want to stay a musician in the LSO for the rest of my life, mm. for the next 30 years. I'll need to find some other things to do. And at that time, talking about 30 years ago, again now, 25, 30 years ago, there was a move for all arts organisations to become engaged in communities and to look at their education and outreach programmes. Mm. And it was driven by the Arts Council here that said, basically, we need you to do some better work out there if you want our money. Yes. And so it concentrated the mind wonderfully for all these organisations. And I got involved in this because I thought, this could be a really interesting journey for me to go on not just playing, but actually taking responsibility for working that interface between the arts and communities. Mm. And I really became interested in it. I mean, so much so that I gave half my job away for the LSO uh, mm. and, and started to run my own programs. But in the course of that, I was working with a friend of mine in, in London, a Japanese rock player who used to work with Ian Jury and, and all sorts of people. We, he'd phone me up at three o'clock in the morning and say, look, can you just come and play on a track for me? So I'd go and play in his studio, nice. and then I'd go to the LSO after that. And Kuma, his name is Kuma Harada, he said, I want you to come and run one of your education projects in Japan, in my hometown. Would you do it? I said, yeah, okay, I'm up for that. So... We managed to ride it on the back of an LSO tour, and we ran one of the first large-scale community arts events uh, in Sapporo, up in the north of Japan. That's where the beer comes from. Yes, it is, yes. <laughs> and it's a very interesting uh, story behind that, and the German that went there to actually set up the brewery. But it was the home of the Pacific Music Festival, which was set up by Bernstein many years ago, and, and we were the resident orchestra for that, and I managed to run a project there. And things suddenly started to roll because of that project. Did you do that in Japanese at the time, or did the Japanese come later? Um, the Japanese came later. And I mean, still, I mean, it's very nice of you to give me these accolades for my Japanese. But when you're in those situations, even people who've lived there for 30 years use translators because they call it semon yogo, the specialist language that you need to use is so critical there. So you can't afford to make mistakes. Sure. But I didn't really speak Japanese at that time at all, really. Uh, and so I was using translators, and Kuma particularly, who had a very interesting way of translating Japanese because he came from a different world, from the rock and, and pop world, and I was a classical musician. It was a really great success. As a result of that, I was contacted by a, an orchestra in Japan who said, could I go and do a workshop for them? I said, yes, yeah, sure. And this is where it gets interesting about Japanese culture and business culture as well. Hmm because it still tends to be the case. They were trying to raise some money to bring me out to Japan to work with this orchestra, which is a Japan film, which I've been connected with for 15, 20 years now. Mm. And they went to the orchestra association and they said, look, would you give us money to bring Mike out? And they said, if this is as good as we think it is, we want Mike to work with all the orchestras in Japan. Amazing. But if you pay for him to come out, they will only work with you. So we're going to take responsibility because then we can push you out into these other orchestras. Amazing. So that, you know, if you came to work with one organisation and you went to work with another, then you would lose that connection with your original organisation. Mm. So this enabled you to do all of them? Yeah, so I did all. All but two, I think, 26 orchestras. Then it went into concert halls, all sorts of things. What is it like working in this completely different context? What do you have to pay attention to? in order to do this successfully what's different from when you run the same thing in 
London, for example? There are some real challenges. The assumptions we make that we can actually just take what we do in London and put it in Japan. And I think that's a, a mistake that people make often. You know, they think what you do maybe in a, a project in Hackney, you can just take and you can drop it into Tokyo. You really can't. Mm. And for many, many reasons, you can't do that because this idea of learning by doing is, uh, when I started, it was completely anathema. You know, that they just had, it was learning by being told that was it. It's not a thing in Japan, then, the learning by doing. It's changing. It's ch- Over these 30 years, it's changed a lot. I know that they come from a very sort of um, Teutonic system. I think it was actually the German system, the Victorian German system that was imported, Bavarian even, which is why yeah. you've still got Japanese students with all the little Bavarian uniforms and so on. That's right. But things you say are changing and, and they're moving from a rote system and they're starting to understand different ways of learning. Bear in mind, the traditional way of learning in Japan was just to follow the sensei, follow yes. the professor, don't ask questions. Yes. And this this thing about questions is really, really interesting because I, I have a, a phrase I often use. I said, you know, in America, they say there's no such thing as a dumb question. No. In England, we say, oh, yes, there is, <laughs> but we still ask the question. <laughs> and in Japan, they say, I've got lots of questions, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. <laughs> and I, I say that to Japanese audiences, and the, the classic uh, expression they make, they'll just put their heads on one side and go, eh. And I've had whole audiences doing that because they know it. And yet, what I've always found fascinating about Japan is that there is so much potential there, but it's how to unlock it. Mm. And, and that involves permission. It involves things like loss of face and, and trying to create situations where they feel safe. Even when I've contracted with, with groups of people, like, right, we're going to have to have some questions at the end of this. Think of what we're going through here, mm. okay, and what the process is. And I'm sure you're going to have questions. And you get to the end of it and say, any questions? Absolute silence. The Japanese call it sheen. And so you're trying to avoid this sheen, <laughs> but they will all sit there. And I've even said, I'm going to sit here until you ask a question. And I've sat there for 20 minutes and nobody's asked a question. You're listening to The Curious Advantage podcast, inspired by the book The Curious Advantage, written by Paul Ashcroft, Simon Brown, and Garrick Jones. Subscribe to the podcast today. Are there things that you've learned from the Japanese culture? What are some of the things that you've brought back from there? Oh, there's been a huge amount uh, to think about the silences. Don't be afraid of the silences. Silences are important. They have a word for it in, in Japan. They call it ma. And the character is there about space. And it's kind of the potential of space and the potential of silence. So these three words, ma, ba, and wa. So ma is this idea of space and silence. Ba is about place. There's a a Harvard Business Review paper about the concept of ba, which was written by Nonaka. Mm. Uh, And I know Nonaka, sensei. Very interesting to look at what we mean by ba and and situation. And then this wa, this idea of harmony and and circle. And so these these are really very important questions. And you notice it uh, in conversations uh, and how conversations or negotiations uh, flow, uh, this idea of ma and letting that space be there and not interrupting, and the way people take turns. Whereas we're quite different in the way we do this yes. sort of negotiation in, in other countries. So how did your curiosity help you engage with this fundamentally different context then? Because you are a curious person, aren't you, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> in the very best Sense of the word. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's funny. I mean, it goes back to, to my my childhood. I mean, I think I've always been interested. It's been part of my life always. The thing that I'm most curious about is what I'm going to be curious about next. Yeah. You know, uh, because all these things appear. But Japan was. I just fell in love with the place. I just loved the challenge. I loved the people and just the system, the way that things worked. But actually. The deeper you get into it, you find that there are so many, so many different levels there. And it is incredibly complex. Of all the societies I've worked with, Mm. you know, if you can try to work with things in Japan, you know, it's pretty good. And you need good advisors to start with that. You can't just turn up and say, well, I'm here. Mm. Because they need to know how to negotiate 
that whole lands, landscape. There's a there's a word, a very important word in Japanese, which is namawashi. And the two characters, are, are the, the first character is, is to do with a root, like the root of a plant. Mm. And mawashi means to go around. So you're going around the roots of the plant. So what you're doing is you're laying the groundwork before you can have any negotiation or any conversations. Consensus building, really. And that's really important. And the order you do it in is important. And I was lucky I had two very good advisors. There was my friend Kuma uh, and also a very old and wise man who worked for the uh, Association of Orchestras, who worked in Chicago for a long time in television, uh, but he knew uh, actually how to put things in place, which is why I ended up by working for 26 orchestras, which is why I met the Empress. Mm. What, I was asked to do a, a demonstration workshop at uh, one of the big halls in uh, central Tokyo, um, which was owned by uh, Nippon Steel, a beautiful hall, and they the hall was given to them, but they needed to pay the musicians. So we did a big project on Petrushka. Mm. We had about a 1,000 people turn up to this, and he needed some money for the orchestra. And he knew that Rostropovich had done a recital for uh, in Japan and given all the proceeds to the empress to use for a project. Mm. So he got in contact with the royal household and said, we need the money for the orchestra. <laughs> and, and she said, well, that seems like a good idea. So she gave the money for the orchestra, and then two days before, uh, I got a call saying, uh, we might have a very important guest at this workshop you're going to run. Good old Rostropovich. Who knew? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's how she came. Yeah. Astonishing. Russian songs in Japanese. I had the whole audience doing that. And she took part. It was fantastic. <laughs> Do you think that curiosity is something you pay attention to specifically? I know you're a curious person and you're full of curiosity, but is it something you think about? I think it's just a part of me, actually, what I do. I mean, you know, I'm very fortunate that people approach me about so many different things mm. because uh, somebody comes to me and said, look, uh, can you work with this group of air conditioning engineers, mm. which happened last year? Can you come up with some sort of a program for them? So now what I've got to do is, like, okay, I need to find about what their work life is like, what's the company like, uh, how might I approach these people, how siloed are they? That was one of the problems, you know, to just trying to find out what the essence of that company is. So as soon as I'm approached with a project, I have to do a lot of learning about that. So the idea about being curious, it, it is part of, of, of my whole being, actually, in many ways, about mm. how I put these things together. This brings us very nicely to Sound Strategies, which is this business that you have, which does amazing things. Now, please tell us some of these incredible things you've done with Sound Strategies, because there's some amazing stories in there. I always felt that there was huge potential in bringing business together with the arts. Mm. And I felt, and I still feel it, that that connection is done very badly. The business people don't really know about the arts, and the arts don't really take time out to learn about business practices and where that real connection is. It's an age-old problem. I mean, we have in London the famous artist placement group, which, you know, fantastic artists who really, this is out of the 60s and 70s, looking at putting artists on the board and did so. And um, an incredible archive, which was shown at Raven Row a few years back. And what they learned, I mean, they've got this archive of all the failure. They learned so much about where business and art does not connect. And yet, mm. why should that be the case? I mean, th we know that there were political things where you had class issues, where people uh, in the 60s at the top of organizations tended to be one class, and artists might be from a very different, not even class, but milieu way of, of living. Those things clashed. But we also know about language, you know, the fundamental proposals of business <laughs> to like, make a profit or to make things efficient are not necessarily at the heart of what artists is, are doing. And then the idea of artists disrupting and opening things up in order to enable things to happen has always been very difficult. But I think more and more we're learning how to do that. I think some organizations are more and more open to learning from artists these days. But as you say, it's got a long way to go. I think what happens is that the artists don't take the time out to learn about what happens in business and business people don't take the time out to learn out what's happening in, in in the arts and what there's still that thinking but that's quite prevalent about you know people who do the arts it's all fluffy stuff and it really isn't no <laughs> it really isn't uh i always felt that this connection I mean, the first people i worked for actually it was i can say it was unilever and they were they had a really interesting approach to things because they had a department called catalyst 
And they felt that to build their competitive advantage, they needed to get their brand teams working with artists. Mm. And they were very strategic about this. And I went in as the music mod and doing projects with them. And then they came back to me. I have to be honest, it wasn't a success what I did, but they seemed to like it because they came back to me. <laughs> and I said, I said, look, if you want me to work with you, I want you to sponsor me to come in and just think about how we can actually help your business case mm. rather than doing some one of these sort of very fuzzy creative projects mm. you know everybody likes but everybody forgets about and the more i looked at it i thought gosh you spend huge amounts of money on putting music in your commercials how do you make that decision mm. and they said we don't know really and i said well how do you justify it to your accountants they said well we don't know <laughs> really <laughs> and, I, and i thought well here is an opportunity, and I, all my engagements that I have with corporates, I, I treat it as a, another education program. I'm there to enable people to make their decisions. I don't want to go in with solutions for them. Sure. I want them to make their own solutions. So I devised a workshop, which was actually called Breaking the Sound Barrier. And we got all these brand teams in, and we got them to make their own music for their brand, just to understand what the process was. You got the participants to make music yes yes and these were yeah. non-musicians ordinary people working yes. you've got to manage expectations you know i mean these aren't professional musicians sure. but the, the point is they came up with something at the end that they understood the process mm. and they made the decisions in that and basically it was all the work i was doing in schools and i've done a huge amount of work with kids and people with disability and it all it's all about this learning by doing building the safe spaces where they can actually take part in making sounds and see, under, understanding how they go together. And it's all based you know, on the soundly based on all the research, you know, people like Vygotsky and Jean Piaget and all those things about learning by doing, working together in groups. Mm. Uh, so it's got a very sound academic basis behind it. Yeah, and I just did the same in, in, with, with these brand teams. And yes. every one of the brand teams went off and they rebriefed their agencies. And they did them in an effective way. And in fact, one of the outcomes, I don't know if you remember uh, some years ago, there was the, the Dove commercials, uh, which were for real women. And they yeah. just had this very simple guitar in the background. Yeah. That was kind of one of the outcomes of the program. We, and and they, it, it worked beautifully. I love the idea that learning by doing can have a real impact in the business world. And also, the, you know, that idea of artists entering business and business understanding art. Those are two worlds colliding. Those are two contexts that have to understand each other. And you say, we need to listen and listen and listen, learn the language, see what people are doing. It's the same as you're going into Japan, isn't it? Entering a completely different context. It's amazing. But you're right with language. Language is the important thing because I realized from sitting on sitting in on meetings with the Royal Opera House and look, you know, sponsorship meetings and people coming in thinking, there's a huge gap here and we we're not talking the same language. So what I did when I left the Royal Opera House, I thought, how can I get to know this better? So I went to Ashridge and I, I went through a, a course on culture changing organizations. I didn't go there necessarily mm. to learn that specific topic. I wanted to hear how people talked. And, and it was radically different. And that was so valuable. And at that time, when I was doing that, I, by now, sound strategists had taken on board, purely fortuitous. I ended up with a, an extraordinary group of business partners. One was the uh, head of global comms for Rover Cars and BMW. Uh, one was the chief executive of Boston Marstella. And we had the person who, as an advisor, was the head of, of global comms for GlaxoSmithKline. And they all had an interest mm. in music. They thought this was really an interesting proposition. They said, this is not just about uh, changing the working practices of brand teams. This is actually a new corporate positioning tool. I mm. didn't know what that meant, but it sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's amazing because, I mean, there's language, of course. There's, there's all, we've talked about language. We've talked about kanji. We've talked about ideograms. But there's also the Romaji, our Roman numerals that we use and alphabets. But then there's visual language, yeah. which you've mentioned, and also visual language is found in the kanji and so on. Oh. But here is another language, the language of sound, Yes, which is it universal? Who knows? But yeah. we all respond to sound in some way if we're able to, and sound grabs us in places that even the visual can't. This whole journey in many ways has got me to think about music radically differently. 
um, from what I, yes. I thought it was. And, and now I think very much as, as music as being, it's um, human musicality is really a, a co-created system for building yes. human relationships, social relationships. And that's all it is in the end. And you can apply that anywhere in the world. Tell me more. Now, in some of the arenas I've worked, I particularly I learned a huge amount uh, when I, I ran the music course at the Royal School for Deaf Children for two years. And that was really extraordinary. And we came up with some uh, fascinating insights. And one of the challenges for those children there, so deafness was kind of a common challenge they all had, uh, but also uh, they had learning difficulties, they had Asperger's syndrome, they, they're all sorts of things, uh, and real, real challenges for these young people. What stuck out strongly was their socialising behaviours were really not very good. And as a result, that was affecting any of the, the academic achievements they were looking at to, to create, you know. And it was all experimental and trying things out. And, and you suddenly learn, working with these young people, that you have to be authentic. They don't care whether you can play concert or anything. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, what they want is to have some sort of connection. I became very deft with my violin of turning it round, and they'd put it in, in their mouths, and they'd hold it in their mouths, and I could play it. And they got this fantastic response. But the biggest learning point we got from that was we were – we happened to have some, some of the kids in a room, and I noticed one of them had gone to the back, and he got these boxes, and he was drumming along with these boxes to something mm. we were doing. And I thought, that's extraordinary. He's absolutely in time with what's happening over mm. here. And so we started to explore this, and eventually the, I mean, the, the teachers there, the carers, were fantastic and up for experimenting and trying things out. And we realized that actually all these children we were working with could uh, appreciate a, a sense of pulse. If you understand where a sense of pulse is, you can work with other people. So we, we actually got them to create a, a basic but very functional little samba group, which because it just mm. works on pulse and, and collections of rhythms. And it was phenomenal. And you suddenly thought, wow, what other effects can this have with these kids? And sure enough, their socialising behaviours changed. Their attainments in school changed. It's profound and phenomenal what we learn from these from these extreme situations. I mean, you are an inspiration, you really are. You're making me think of um, Quincy Jones, <laughs> because, who's another inspiration. Yeah. And I've been listening to a lot of vinyl recently and got out one of my Quincy Jones records, yeah. which has that thing, Everything Must Change, that, that song, Everything Must Change on it. Yeah. And the lyrics go, everything must change. There are not many things we can be sure of, except that rain comes from the clouds, yeah. sun lights up the sky, Hummingbirds do fly, and music makes me cry. Yes. What are you personally most curious about, Michael? As I said earlier, you know, I'm most most curious about where my next dose of curiosity is going to come from. Do you have a hint? <laughs> At the moment, I've been looking into AI, actually, funnily enough, recently, because hmm. there was a statement made by Stuart Russell in the Reef Lectures last year when he felt that the next iteration of AI really needed to involve artists. And I thought, well, mm. what do you mean by that? Uh, and it's not just getting a bunch of writers or painters or musicians together and putting them in a room. It's actually, I think you need to get people there who actually understand what the purpose of these art forms is. What's deep down? Mm. How are they functioning? You know, as this idea about music being this uh, co-created system of building social relationships, you know. So yeah. is that the area which is really important to the development of AI? Is it that? It's not about making tunes or all that sort of thing. You know, well, how do we actually make those connections with people? That's what got me thinking. So I've been reading a lot about AI recently and just thinking about how the arts can feed into that. Well, we have to wrap up, Michael, but if there's one thing to leave our subscribers with, what would it be? I was thinking that, that curiosity in itself, we talk about curiosity being like a muscle, and the more you use it, the stronger it gets. But I think you've mm. also got to think about how you apply it. If you go to a gym and you work out in a gym and you build all this, mu this muscle power, basically you lose your flexibility as well. So what are you going <laughs> to do with that muscle power? How are you going to apply it? What is the purpose of you being there? So I think for me, being curious is important. I mean, I've got, I've got this little matrix I, I talk about. It's a creativity matrix, which starts with curiosity, how we make decisions, and relationships. And that works really well for mu making music and all sorts of situations. And so as part of that, you have to have an idea about what is the purpose of putting all this together? 
Where am I going to go with mm. this curiosity? Because otherwise, you can be endlessly curious, and we can spend hours on the computer looking at things, which is fascinating. But in the end, I have to have an aim for that as well. So that's why, even though it's a muscle, how am I going to apply those muscles? And where, where do I intend them to go? That's very wise. And thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate the conversation. It's been fun. You've been listening to a Curious Advantage podcast with Michael Spencer, who's taken us all over the world, especially to Japan, made us think about how we enter different contexts, made us think about visual language and language systems and how we process the sound and how can sound be used and how can we be curious about it and how does it take us into worlds that we don't necessarily know about? How do they open up? I was fascinated that it was his violin that took him into a whole new context, something he knew already, but opened up a whole new world. We're curious to hear from you. If you think there was something useful or valuable from this conversation, we encourage you to write a review for the podcast on your preferred channel, saying why this was so and what have you learned from it. We always appreciate hearing our listeners' thoughts and having a curious conversation. Join today at hashtag Curious Advantage. The Curious Advantage book is available on Amazon Worldwide. Order your copy now to further explore the seven C's model for being more curious. Subscribe today and keep exploring curiously. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the Curious Advantage podcast. The Curious Advantage book is now available to purchase on Amazon. Stay tuned for the next episode and keep exploring curiously. This podcast is produced by Aliki Palinelli and John McGinty and edited by Jill Damatak-Futter. 